now that you know that uh, Nadia can live code way better in Python than I could. <laughs> uh, uh, well, first, I, thanks to Nadia. That was very good. Uh, it was great to see you all here, and I was like, oh, that's what your research does. It's like you turn that into machines that do it for you. It's like, sweet. Okay. So, um, I'm here to talk about gradual typing, uh, which is uh, the area that I've been doing research in for quite a while. And you may have heard a little bit about it, but I'll just kind of give you my perspective on it. So, um, first off, I'm going to start off with just a little bit about myself. Because um, I was in your shoes, I used to say not too long ago, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so old. Like, I don't know what any of the three letter acronyms on Twitter mean. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, so I started out uh, as an electrical engineer. Uh, I went to Notre Dame and um, uh, really didn't like it, electrical engineering, so I decided to get another degree in electrical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you're veggies, like, electrical engineering is going to you. Um, and eventually, at some point, I, I figured out that computer science was kind of cool. I was like, huh, I'm getting better grades in all my programming classes than in anything that has to do with circuits. Maybe I should do that. Um, and then I got suckered into programming languages when I took a class with uh, this amazing professor, Dan Friedman, and never looked back. So I uh, ended up getting a uh, PhD in doing programming language. So then from there, I, I moved to Rice University for a year where I was a postdoc. Uh, it's the home of the owls, is their uh, uh, mascot. Uh, but they also have these really weird squirrels in, in Houston that like lay down on the sidewalk when you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, why are you laying on the sidewalk? So it's like, the squirrels are really the thing. <laughs> I might have done some research. <laughs> so then uh, from there I moved on to, to Carnegie kind of Mellon, home of the, the Tartan flag, which is a flag from Scotland. And I finally saw a Tartan flag when I went to Scotland this summer. It was really cool. Um, uh, I had to use Nadia's uh, sad solver a little bit, but luckily I'm old, so I didn't need to, to figure out how to drink whiskey. So, coming up there, uh, I ended up uh, getting a position at the uh, University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, and Vancouver is pretty awesome. And as far as like things that I do when I'm not um, programming, I really like to play all my first video, except uh, against uh, Sam Tobin Hogsbed, because A, A, he also researches gradual typing, so we're enemies, and then B, he's way better than me at it. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimate. Ultimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gradual time. That guy makes garbage. Good idea. So, um, there's a, kind of this long-standing divide, kind of that uh, I always talk about between, uh, in in like programming communities. And you may have seen it on on the internet. So you know, it's on on occasion, but it's like you know, do I use static or do I use dynamic enforcement? You know, people who like static checking say that you, know, you get really nice error, early error checking, and it's like, oh, my comments are checked, and uh, you know, I program with the types, like follow the types, you know, and, uh, and you get smart developer tools. And then, you know, on the other hand, you have these, uh, uh, this, this group of people who like, like to use languages that are considered dynamic, and you get uh, rapid prototyping, and you can have some sort of flexible idioms, and, and uh, the expressive power of language is really powerful if you have a good macro system. Uh, like in that code on language that Sam works on. So there's this kind of seeming idea that there's this persistent divide between these two camps, and you know, they, they, there's just going to be this tension, and at some point it will explode, and there can only be one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't know. <laughs> So, so gradual typing is really uh, uh, trying to study to find a way to blend these two things so you can have uh, sound reasoning principles about your code, by which I mean like, like you're not making up stuff, it's not truthiness, but some sort of kind of useful information about the behavior of your program while being able to turn the dial back and forth between static and dynamic checking. Um, and so this, uh, the name came uh, in a lot of the, the research that I built. Uh, Builds off this work by uh, Jeremy Siegel. Uh, uh, this was my boss in Rice, uh, where I should have been doing research, but was looking at the scores. Um, 
and, and the work kind of comes from there. So, so the idea roughly is that you have like a, a, a dynamic language, and you can tell it's dynamic because it's orange or red, uh, which really just means one color. Um, and then you have like a, a static language, and uh, it has you know, type annotations. Uh, this isn't like the main version of Python, this actually means something here. So, uh, you, what you want is there to be kind of this idea of like, well, you know, what if I wrote programs that, that mix both together at the same time? And most people don't switch languages every line of code, but you want to think of this as, as say, modules that link together. And you want to say like, well, what, is real, what does it really mean to have a sort of mixed language where I have part of my code is, is dynamic and part of my code is static and being able to shift the dial? So, at the least, you expect some kinds of behaviors out of a system like this. On the one hand, you'd hope that uh, when there's uh, some sort of inconsistency in the static part of your code, that it actually works like a statically typed language where you, you get an error uh, before you run the code. But then on the other hand, you wouldn't be surprised to find that there are sometimes uh, inconsistencies between uh, code that's in the dynamic part of your language and code that's in the static part of your language that isn't caught by a type checker, but it, it better be caught at least by runtime. You don't want it to just kind of go off and uh, uh, format your hard drive or email all of your private letters to the New York Times or something like that. Occasionally, I wonder if I should employ software like that. But moving on. Um, so I, I said that there's this idea of you know we want sound reasoning principles in such a language where the the types even even as you blend static and dynamic, you want the types to be meaningful and useful to guide you. And so it's sometimes easier to explain. What would an instance of unsound reasoning be? Like, what's a thing we don't want? So here's a, an interesting example from a, a paper about the TypeScript programming language. So TypeScript is developed at Microsoft, and it's built on top of JavaScript. And it's saying, like, let's kind of add type check, like add a, a type system to uh, JavaScript, where you have comments, and then you have type errors. And uh, one, of the, one of the main goals of the TypeScript project in particular was this benefit that we could build smart developer tools, like your IntelliSense would work a lot better type information in your program. Uh, but uh, often you'll hear it said that, uh, oh, type, TypeScript is unsound. And in a way, it's like saying, uh, it sounds like you're saying, like, TypeScript is more of, like, like commits moral turpitude. Or, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, vows to the, 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 the dark deity or something. But what, what it actually means is something technical. It's a technical term that's not often uh, spelled out. And an in, in instance of it is this program where you have a, a type string uh, in your code, and then what's the first thing you do is try to see if the type of it is string, and then return minus one, otherwise keep going. Now, your type reasoning is like, well, why am I, do, why am I checking the type of string? You already told me it's string. Like, my mental model is it's a string, so it should be a string, but it's not a string necessarily. And what the, the, the behavior of TypeScript is such that just because you said that something's going to be a string here doesn't mean that it's going to that when you link this code with the rest of your code base, that you're going to get a string or it will protect you from it. So what they say is like, despite annotating the formal parameter C as a string, the proven TypeScript programmer must be check that the object received is indeed a string using JavaScript reflection. You're like, I thought the whole point was not to have to use reflection when the types protect you from using reflection and benefiting from reflection where you, you want to avoid typing. So this is kind of an example of not what we want. And I think it's useful to kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking about what might happen. So this is an example that uh, I, I stole with permission from Ben Greenman, who's a, uh, a graduate student at uh, Northeastern, uh, who also works on, on gradual typing. And what he was kind of trying to get across was the idea that not only can you get weird behavior, uh, like weird errors out of a program, but you can also get like malicious bad behavior out of a program where you are expecting your types to protect your abstractions and they don't. So what he says is you start off with, like, ignore, the, ignore the right for now, you start off with this like untyped language and you have a voting machine where you can add votes and one of the things they say is like, you know, we don't want you to uh, give me votes that are negative, you know, we don't allow dark matter to vote because we're, we're prejudiced against it. But, uh, or really, you just don't want voter suppression. So, as, as, as is, you just say add votes negative one, and you know, suddenly dark matter takes over, and it uh, starts uh, having, uh, uh, basically taking down all institutions because it's dark matter. So, 
<laughs> this side, like, we need better coding. So you switch over to a, a typed language where you say, like, oh, look, it's like this number is going to be a natural number, so it's going to be greater than zero. And you may still allow this module to handle with others. So you're like, well, we don't need this assert anymore. This is very similar to the TypeScript uh, example earlier. So either the system itself, thanks to optimization power, removes this assert, or a human being who's, like, based on the global reasoning, removes it. And then suddenly, you link with this and uh, dark matter rules. Dark matter does kind of rule. It's a really weird idea. But uh, the point being that you can have really bad errors in your code if, you're, uh, if you can't really trust your types in the parts where you use them. So I'm just going to give you kind of a little taste of the theory behind the gradual typing just to get a sense of what's going on in the papers that work on this stuff. Um, and so this, was, uh, this is Jeremy and Wally. Well, I don't know why these pictures are from, but uh, both of them were working on this work at the time. And uh, the basic idea is, and this is a, a typical thing that you'll see in a, a PL paper where you, you just, it's basically a data structure definition uh, for a really boring data structure. And so you've got your types, and you've got your base types, and your, your function types. And this is like your static type system. This is the thing that you normally think of. And so what the gradual type system does is it adds like, uh, this question mark, it's like the unknown type. Like, you know, instead of being like, yes, I'm an integer, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> could be number, could be, you know, your kitten gifs, whatever. Uh, and then somehow the, 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 the system is built around the idea that having like lack of knowledge ends up being uh, blended with the idea of definitely knowing some things and saying like, what can we what, can, what uh, knowledge can we keep knowing that we're mixing like the lack of information with the presence of information? Sorry, a quick question. Yeah, um, sure. How does this relate to type variables? Uh, so a type variable is, is unknown in the sense that this is a specific thing, yeah. but I don't know which one. Okay. This one's like, it's not a specific thing. <laughs> <laughs> I make no commitments. Like, you're just going to have to figure out, it out when you run the program. And that's kind of the key, is like, figure it out when you run the program. Great question. Yeah? Does that, does that correspond to somewhere on the pipe lattice? Like, I mean, is it like any type, or? Ah, another great question to you. Like, is this like subtyping or something like that? It's like, it's not. Uh, <laughs> thank goodness. It's like, oh, it's just Java. Damn you. <laughs> and the reason is like, so even the object type, uh, you, so in, in object-oriented language, you sometimes have like types at the top where it's like any of your things can fit in here. But what you're sort of saying there is like it's a thing, like it's definitely an object. It definitely has these features. Uh, there may be more features, but I've got some some knowledge. And this is like I don't know Jack. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting though, and it, and it appears on the, the next slide, uh, is that. There is an ordering to uh, our types with respect to this idea of knowledge, and it looks a lot like uh, what you'd have in subtyping or something like that, but it ends up behaving a little funny. Like something, I guess, unfunny happens to the left of the arrow is the same. Um, if you know subtyping. So up here, you're just like, yeah, we, we, like, we don't know anything. Uh, we're just not going to worry about it type theoretically. Here, you're like, oh, it's a function. Like, what, is it, what does it take? What does it give me? <laughs> and you work your way down, and you're kind of like, here you're like, uh, I don't know what you give me, but whatever you do, you're definitely getting back true or false. <laughs> like, so what do you want for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas this one over here is like, you give it a number, and you have no idea what's happening. You know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, I'm 21 years old. It's like, well, let me tell you about the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> <laughs> I want the gin and tonic. <laughs> and then you kind of keep, you can kind of keep working your way down this lattice. And what's interesting is um, this part here, where I jump to the, where something happens on the left, uh, tends to be this is sort of the wrong thing that happens according to what subtyping works. Like it gets more precise if you go down from the left, whereas in this thing called subtyping, which is how object-oriented languages work, you should only be able to get weaker because you can't sort of gain knowledge. So that's called type precision. And the thing on the right is like, it's like, uh, I'm less imprecise down here. I'm, ground, I'm grounded in truth. 
Greta's over here, and like, we're floating in the sky, a little too much, uh, uh, we'll say, whippets. <laughs> yeah, I am from Canada. Um, <laughs> so, what ends up happening is you need to kind of blend the things that you know about type systems with this idea of uh, uh, imprecise information and kind of mash the two together to get a new idea, which is sort of like, let me, let me use my normal reasoning as much as I can, but I'm going to have to like add some slack into the system because sometimes you're just like, I don't know, just go with it. So you end up extending this idea of like, you know, we know what equality is on types. You're just like, it's an int. Yeah, it's an int. It's a bull. It's a bull. Like, that's not the same function. And if you use them, if you use them in different places, bad things will happen. And so this thing here is called consistency, and it's basically created using precision and type of quality. And it behaves, when you give it static stuff, it behaves like static stuff. So you're like, if I have two bulls, they're definitely consistent with one another because they're equal. And on the other hand, if you give me two quote unquote functions that have nothing to do with one another, uh, no, they're not consistent with one another. I know they're not consistent with one another. But then when you start reasoning about things where you're like, yeah, I've made no commitments. It has to be like, well, OK, you might not be totally crazy town, so we'll let this slide. It's like, you can call this like the, the not totally crazy town uh, relation. Consistency. So then, uh, the type system is typically built uh, using something uh, called a, like typing rules. And we can really think of this as just sort of a a data structure that describes why your program was typed the way it is. And so it's like, oh, like it can follow it up. It's like, well, I, I have an addition. And uh, if there's an addition in my code, it's going to have type int. And it's like, why does it have type int? Well, because I was able to figure out that this thing had type int and that this thing had type int. So as long as I, you give me two integers, then adding them together will give me an integer. And that's kind of how you can read that, basically. This is basically saying stuff that's happening in the rest of your program. Like, considering all the stuff that's happening in the rest of your program, does this whole thing mean integer? And the reason this matters is because, you know, what if this is like a program variable or something like that? You need to know something about it. You need to know, like, basically, whenever I call this code, somebody's going to pass me an int. It's kind of captured in this spot. So in the gradual world, things get a little bit more slacky, where you're like, basically, yeah, this thing has, uh, it better be, have a type in the environment, which here so far means like, you're going to give me something. I don't know what it is. And like here's like, you're going to give me something. I'm not committing it to what it is. And what these two things are saying, yeah, but once you get here, you better be an int. Like, I'm going to demand that you be an int. And if for some reason I can't, uh, like at runtime, prove that you're an int, I'm going to fail. And if, you can't prove, if I can't prove at runtime, at least by runtime, that you're an int, you're going to fail. Now, if either of these was a real static type, it would just fail the compile time. That's how you get the compile time check. But if it's like, I don't know, then it just says, I'm going to figure it out later. But the result here, no matter what, is if the program didn't die, the number is coming out here. And that is what helps us with this sort of uh, TypeScript problem that I talked about, that at certain points, you definitely know what's going to happen if the program hasn't died. So the beginning of the talk had, you know, Batman and Joker, and uh, these colored things are like, oh, I've got a dynamic language and I've got a static language. And I've been talking about question marks and lack of knowledge and whippets. So <laughs> there's sort of this connect question of like, what's the, what's the connection between these two? And really, what you can basically do is say, I can take a program written in these two languages and translate them into the one language to rule them all. And that's the, the gradual language, which kind of captures both of them and everything in between. And then all of the, all of the, questions that you ask that end up being in this particular language, which is kind of about the <clears throat> perfect agglomeration of these two things. Like, you know, you, you've got the peanut butter, and you've got the jelly, and you know, like, let's make dirty hands. So, so, the, so the theory of gradual typing ends up being within that context. And the static type checking is kind of as I described. But because some things you're sort of like, I don't know, I'll let it slide, you have to instrument your program. So you use the information that you got from type checking to build like a program that has a bunch of runtime checks in it. So uh, a thing I like to tell people is that 
we often think about this idea of, of static typing, and the, like the static versus dynamic divide as being, uh, you know, those racket chumps, you know, will someday find the light and then discover it's static types. Uh, and the racket chumps will always win. Um, but, uh, and, and so, you know, people like Jeremy start, Jeremy and Wally started out with that idea. And they were like, oh, you know, we can make this work for, for simple types. And so he showed this. And then somebody asked, well, isn't that just the any type? And, and Jeremy's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody's like, well, is it a type variable? And Jeremy and his friend, uh, and Nature, like, no. <laughs> But then it kind of keeps going on. And it's, it's figured out like, oh, like you can you can you can uh, think about like, oh, I have like a simple type system. But then there's this work that uh, uh, people in Southern California, like like Nadia and her colleagues, have been working on, where you've got these things called refinements, which is like static, staticer, <laughs> staticer, and then you're like, you know, and then once you've drunk the Kool Aid, you're like. You people using normal Haskell with your lame dynamic types, like why aren't you using liquid Haskell? <laughs> like right, Nikki? Yeah. <laughs> Always ranting on the internet. <laughs> but there's even more things like that. So there's like this thing called the type and effect system, which is not just about what kind of thing that you can be, but it's like what did you do on the way to, to creating the thing. And once again, you would be like, over here, it's like, yeah, look, I know that I have an int. And you're like, yeah, but before I gave you the int, I mailed all your private pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so, use static types. It's all relative. And then finally, there is this thing called security typing, where you say, like, oh, like, I, like here, let me tell you something private and intimate about myself. And then here, let me tell you something public. And you're like, Oh great! Like l let me pass this on to you know the person next door. Your 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 public information. Oh, I crossed hands. I leaked the information that you wanted to keep private. So there are type systems to help protect you from that, and you can actually uh, build a system like this to allow you to take some podunk dynamic program and then slowly start making sure that some of your private things stay private without having to redo the entire program. And to me, like this is what gradual typing is, and not just that. And there's more. There's a lot of people working on this with a lot of different questions. So um, that's kind of my point. <laughs> static or <laughs> so ultimately, this is the vision that we want in gradual type, or at least that I want. And this is like what keeps me going. But luckily, like I have a job because uh, I have full employment. Because there's always more problems to solve, even in this space. We're not done yet. I, I can't like uh, turn uh, turn off the lights. So. Really, you could say, at the moment, things are more like their frenemies. Like, we really want them to work together, but they don't play well. So let me quickly go through like a few of the, the challenges that uh, kind of exist in the, this field, and you'll find a few more this week. So one of the, the, the big things in the, in the room is like, how well do these things run? Like, in practice, like, are they too, are they too slow? And so there's this, this great paper called the Sound Gravel Typing Dead Reset, which really came up with the way of, like, here's how you measure these systems. And people are not very good at, at measuring them and not good at implementing them. Yet. We've got to figure out how. Uh, or retrofitting. Like, if I, if, I started with a, if I start with a static system, it actually turns out it's really nice to get dynamic. But how do you go in the other direction? Uh, and how do you do that, like, without having to rewrite your entire code base? Like, meaning the code base for your compiler and your runtime system. And then, you know, how do I get even fancier types, type disciplines? And then really, like, what the hell? Like, really? Like, unknown type? How should we really think about these things? So, so here, though, you'll, there, it turns out that you'll hear a bit uh, when you go to the main conference about a, a bunch of things that are in this space. So there's a, a whole gradual typing session, um, which is, like, really cool. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be uh, led by a... Uh, Eric Tontair, who's a really good friend of mine, and I do a lot of work with him. And he lives in Chile, so when it's cold here, I go visit him do research. And I wear shorts and sandals, it's great. Um, so one talk will be about, oh, I had circles around things, and they disappeared. So uh, there'll be a, a talk here that's uh, by uh, uh, Ben and Matias. And this is really kind of dealing with both performance and with this retrofitting thing, which is 
how do I, if I have a bunch of different approaches to retrofitting, how much can I trust my type information and how fast will it run? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Stupid animation. Um, and then there'll, there'll be a talk about uh, this cost issue where you're dealing with performance. And what this thing is trying to do is say, like, let me give you some advice on which parts of your program to add types to so that it will run, and it will run faster and get you more guarantees. And then uh, the last talk in that session will be uh, both about how do I retrofit languages and what the heck is gradual typing, uh, which is to say what they try to answer is you give me your podunk gradual type system language implementation, and I'll give you a proof methodology for figuring out that, yeah, you really didn't create nonsense. It is a gradual type language. So uh, since it's the first day, I have no idea who will actually be here. Um, but here's kind of a, a swath of people who work on gradual typing who are here, and uh, you can definitely like track them down. Uh, they don't write very hard. Um, you know, just like give them, make sure you have a sweater on. Hi, I like your work. Tell me about gradual typing. Uh, and, yeah, that's the end of my talk. My question relates to that. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of Haskell's f defer type errors. Um, um, and people usually hate me for that. Um, <laughs> um, but what happens in Haskell is then, as soon as you hit sort of one of these type errors, even if it would be fine at runtime, it just sort of crashes. Right. Um, so the difference here is that you can actually run your programs. Um, yeah. Is that sort of the main difference, or the like the the, the it's a, is it's that the selling point, why this is better than like just deferring type errors like in Haskell? Yeah, so this question, actually Stephanie asked me this question like, uh, I think a year ago or two, so two. Um, uh, so I guess you program in Haskell, so. <laughs> 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 uh, so the answer is yes, sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the, yeah, what deferred type errors kind of does is says like, the type, the type system like really is unhappy about this. You're going to die immediately, yeah. but not but not just yet immediately. You're like only mostly dead. So, if, <laughs> but if you ever get here, I'm just going to immediately say no. Yeah. Whereas uh, in this system, if you end up in a situation where you're like this definitely can't work, you get no statically. But if you get into a situation where I don't have enough information to prove you wrong yet, then you keep running, and that's kind of the main difference. Yeah. Also, wonder what would. Oh, if it doesn't shoot that spot, what do you think of my pixels? Oh, no, no, I'll, 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 I'll. All right, just my pie's implementation. What do you think about my pie in terms of sound? Uh, I don't, I know my pie exists, but I don't know enough about it to comment. I'm sorry. No. Um, but if you tell me about it later, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How often does this lead you to unexpected or um, undetected type coercion? So for example, if you had they say you had something that you thought should be a number to do an add operation, but then actually to make it work, you had an integer and a float, so it type coerces one of them into a float, and then you get a floating point error, and, ah, and the whole thing okay. just spirals. Like yeah, so how does like coercion among values yeah. uh, uh, hurt you? The answer is, if it hurts you in your static type system, it will continue to hurt you in the gradual system. <laughs> if it doesn't hurt you in your static system, it won't affect you in the gradual system. You're, like, you are nailed to your particular type system. And, and 
that's kind of the, the design here. So, the, so in purpose, in a sense, you're saying like I have to choose what the ground is, and then everything becomes a little wavy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.